Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here today for this webinar. This is Ryan Crodel at Valencell. Uh, I'm showing a few minutes before the top of the hour, and we've still got quite a few people uh, joining into the webinar here. So uh, I will uh, get started here in the next few minutes, but want to make sure we give everyone a chance to get logged in and uh, settled in before we go. So uh, uh, be patient for just a few more minutes and we will get started. Thank you. All right. Hello once again, everyone. This is Ryan Crodel at Valencell. I uh, wanted to thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here today for this webinar on hearables, which of course is a very hot topic these days. And um, what I will go through is, is uh, kind of how we got to where we are today in terms of the hearables market. And then what are some of the key drivers behind the the growth going on today in hearables and what we expect to see uh, going forward in the future a few quick housekeeping items before we dive in um, the we like to keep these as interactive as possible so if you have questions or if, the, if there's something you'd like me to dive deeper on please do submit your questions through the uh, through the webinar interface and I will take those as they come in and uh, address them accordingly and then um, one of the uh, common questions we get is can we get access to the slides and the recording of the webinar and the answer to both of those is yes we uh, usually within 24 hours or so after the webinar uh, send out links to both the slides and the recording of the webinar. The recordings of all of our webinars are on. Uh, the topic around the evolution of hearables and one of uh, one of the things that we need to start with of course is what is a hearable and um, what uh, how do we define a hearable uh, here at Valence Hill you can uh, of course get a variety of different definitions depending on who you ask 
but that is uh, that's typical in these uh, uh, emerging uh, high growth markets. The way we look at it is a hearable is a connected ear worn device that utilizes smart sensing technology of some kind. Uh, typically, that is um, an audio earbud or augmented hearing device with some form of uh, some form of sensors or additional capabilities beyond just listening to audio or augmenting hearing. So this could be a biometric sensor, it could be an accelerometer, it could be a gyroscope, it could be uh, a variety of different sensor modalities that uh, have now gotten to the point where they are small enough and accurate enough to to fit inside of an ear-worn device. But that's, at, at a very high level, that's how we define hearables. And this seems to be uh, in line with how most of the industry analysts, uh, the groups like IDC and Gartner and, uh, and Juniper all um, align around a definition that is, um, that's fairly close to this, if not, uh, if not exactly aligned. So um, that's what we're talking about when we, when we say uh, hearable, and that, that can include both uh, consumer devices as well as uh, medical devices and, um, and really everything in between. We'll get into that uh, more in, uh, in just a bit, but I uh, wanted to start with a definition there. And the, the interesting thing is hearables are relatively new to the overall wearables market. Uh, obviously, the Apple's AirPods and the introduction of the, the AirPods has brought a lot of attention as uh, any device that, that Apple brings to market, it, it uh, brings a lot of attention to the form factor and the market for those types of devices. But uh, hearables have been around for uh, more than uh, or before the <laughs> before the AirPods. And um, and the the original hearable, as we like to say, uh, or hearing aids and, and our hearing aids and, and you're seeing some really interesting advancements going on in the hearing health space with uh, with regards to hearing aid, hearing aids as, all, as well as um, consumer oriented devices as well. And so some of those really interesting things are driving um, some significant uh, existing growth and growth expectations over the next few years. Um, and, and most people think when they when they hear wearables and they talk about the wearables market, most people think of smartwatches and fitness bands. And while that is that is a significant portion of the the market, certainly, um, if you look at Gartner's most recent forecast around wearable devices, they expect by 2022 that hearables will be the largest category of wearable devices uh, within the, the broader context of the wearables market. So, um, and uh, that being at around uh, a little under 160 million units per year uh, by 2022, up from uh, just 33 million units last year. And, um, and so that's, that's obviously a, a um, tremendous growth trend and, um, and not something you hear much about in, in terms of the, the, um, the overall wearables market, uh, at least currently. You're starting to hear more and more about it. In fact, IDC, the, the research organization just yesterday, put out some very similar numbers to, to these, at least in terms of the, the ratio of hearables to uh, wearables worn on other parts of the body. So um, they are also seeing significant growth in uh, ear-worn devices and, and hearables as a whole. So um, why, uh, why the, the massive growth expectations here around hearables? And, and uh, we at, at Valence Cell have, have been incorporating our biometric sensors into hearable devices, uh, gosh, for about six years now. The, I think the, the first uh, biometric sensing uh, audio earbud came to market in 2013, and uh, and we've been uh, doing that ever since with um, with additional products. So we've been we've been seeing this growth trend uh, kind of from the uh, from behind the scenes, if you will. But it's it's certainly in line with the trajectory we see in the the uh, our customer base and the the other companies we're talking to in terms of their 
their plans for future products in the next two to three year time frame. So what are, what are some of those things that are driving um, that hearables growth? And there's really some, some large trends converging around hearables that go much, far beyond the, the hardware uh, encompassed in these devices. And, and first and foremost, it's the, first, the massive growth of mobile devices. I've seen some numbers recently that now two thirds of the world's population have mobile devices uh, globally. And so it's um, and nearly everyone has um, has a certainly a mobile phone, if not a, a smartphone. And the smartphone penetration is growing rapidly and it, to the point where it mobile devices have become the world's primary mechanism for consuming audio, which, of course, um, lends itself to hearable devices with more capabilities to be able to interact with those mobile devices without having to touch the mobile device. And that's um, that's becoming more and more of a trend, especially now that companies, particularly Apple, but others are, are following in this trend of removing the headphone jack from these mobile devices, which means there, there needs to be a wireless connection and in particular, the, the growth of uh, in, in popularity of what, what's called true wireless uh, earbuds uh, and, and headphones, like the ones you see here from Jabra, meaning just that the earbuds themselves are, are rapidly growing in popularity. And um, a, a lot of it has to do with the, the consumption of audio and also the removal of, of the headphone jacks from uh, all of these billions of mobile devices uh, out in the world today. The next one, of course, is uh, voice assistant. So I mentioned being able to, to interact with and leverage the capabilities of the mobile devices without actually touching that mobile device. That's mostly done today through voice assistants. And in, in some cases, it's done through touch capabilities or buttons on the, on the hearables themselves. But more and more, it's becoming voice activated, voice assistant capabilities through the hearable device that um, connect with the, the mobile device and access some form of capability uh, on that device, whether it's conducting a mobile search or listening to an audio book or um, leveraging some other capability of the mobile device. Uh, I saw some numbers recently that uh, from Juniper Research out of the UK that they estimate that there are two and a half billion different devices around the world today. Actually, at, by, at the end of 2018, there were two and a half billion voice assistant enabled devices around the world. Now, that's more than just the mobile devices, of course. They're embedding voice assistants into, uh, obviously, the home speakers like the ones you see here, but also into appliances and TVs and, uh, and desktop computers and a variety of different um, uh, form factors for those those voice assistants, but certainly the mobile devices are the largest portion of those voice assistants deployed in the world today, and many of those are being accessed through uh, through hearable devices. That, by the way, uh, Juniper expects the number of voice assistant enabled devices in the world to grow to eight billion by 2023. So it um, uh, another uh, massive growth trend there. Next is the, the streaming video anywhere and this trend around cutting the cord from cable services and utilizing streaming services for entertainment, whether that's movies or TV or whatever the, the video content of choice may be. You're starting to see more and more people switch to um, on demand, um, uh, video on demand and on the go. And of course, much of that video is being consumed for mobile devices, which require uh, a hearing device of some kind in order to enjoy that entertainment. And, and much of that is, is driven by smart uh, ear-based devices or, or hearables. And so, in fact, the, the, um, the Motion Picture Association of America says that the streaming video subscriptions like Netflix and Hulu and HBO Go and uh, Amazon Prime, all these, those video subscriptions around the world now outnumber cable television subscriptions. And the, the growth trends are for those two uh, 
for video on demand and cable are certainly moving in opposite directions with video on demand still continuing to grow exponentially and, and cable declining. So you're, this whole notion around streaming video, not just in your home, but the ability to access that video content anywhere you go on any type of mobile device, whether it's a phone, tablet, or, uh, or other type of mobile devices, certainly um, uh, accelerating this trend around hearables because, of course, in addition to the video, you need the audio in order to uh, enjoy that entertainment. Next, you see you're seeing a similar shift in social media. So uh, with Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and, and even things like LinkedIn, uh, uh, a, a large amount of the content is um, is video now and video based. And of course, um, that requires audio in order to um, uh, appreciate the Snapchat stories or um, other uh, other video content that's being distributed over social media now, and then of course if you throw YouTube into this, that's uh, that's an obvious um, uh, obvious one as well. In fact, according to um, Mary Meeker's 2019 Internet Report, um, she's a venture capitalist and uh, produces a, a, a a widely distributed and and uh, closely watched report around internet trends. That was uh, she released that just about a month or so ago, and according to that, according to her research, YouTube and Instagram are the fastest growing social media platforms in the world, um, primarily driven by the consumption of video. Obviously, with YouTube, it's all video, and um, and with uh, with Instagram, it's becoming more and more video as uh, as those growth patterns play out. So, um, same thing as the streaming video, you need um, it, you need some way to hear that, and hearables are, are certainly benefiting from those trends in um, consuming video, particularly over mobile devices. Um, next is interactive gaming. So um, online gaming's been been around for quite a while, but has certainly taken off in the last few years with games like Fortnite and and other um, online multiplayer uh, experiences that um, that uh, are almost all always consumed with um, with a headset of some kind involved because the players are talking to each other, communicating with each other, interacting with each other as a core part of the game play. And in fact, um, you're seeing uh, these uh, these interactive gaming platforms, particularly Fortnite as kind of the the poster child for this trend it are becoming uh, the primary ways and the areas where uh, where kids are hanging out with each other these days and and uh, communicating and socializing. In fact, the the company that um, that owns Fortnite, Epic Games, just bought a um, a video conferencing platform called House Party uh, to incorporate into their platform. Uh, as a way to augment their capabilities to allow their uh, players to better interact with each other, better communicate with each other while they are playing the game. And so, of course, all of this is done through headsets and hearables of some kind. Um, and so you're starting to see um, uptake there with uh, with hearables associated with that as well. And that's not even to mention all of the, the platforms around watching people play online video games. So platforms like Twitch that Amazon bought a few years ago for over a billion dollars, um, that is uh, also typically consumed with a headset or a, a hearable involved. And, and so um, there's not just the, the gaming itself and the players interacting in those gamings, but people watching those people playing games is, um, it is seeing a tremendous amount of growth recently. Um, next, you look at the uh, uh, trajectory and the growth patterns around telehealth, and particularly um, as it relates to, and we'll talk more about this in, in just a moment, but the ability to measure biometrics and vital signs through uh, ear-based devices combined with the telehealth platforms and the growth in, um, and interest in telehealth uh, as a mechanism for 
delivering healthcare services is seeing a, a great deal of growth. So in the US, um, nearly, and this is back from the, the Mary Meeker report as well, just here in the US, nearly 80% of the, the hospitals and healthcare facilities now have telehealth capabilities. And one of those, one of the major companies behind telehealth or the, the technology platforms that enable telehealth is a company called Teladoc. And they are reporting that they do uh, nearly 3 million telehealth visits per year, or did uh, nearly 3 million telehealth visits per year in uh, 2018. And that, that growth trajectory is, is exponential. I think they did uh, less than half of that in 2017. So there's, um, there's a great deal of growth there in, um, in the telehealth space as well. And then, of course, there's a, an explosion of audio content that's going along with all of uh, this growth in mobile devices and hearables as well. So um, uh, audio books are becoming a, a primary platform for publishing uh, what used to be hardcover books. In fact, there are some prominent authors now who are launching um, audio book only or la launching their next books on uh, on audio only. There will not be any print or digital versions of, of these books. Uh, the, the platform and the, that uh, medium for uh, consuming books has become so popular that there are some authors that are going all in on that. Um, podcasting is another great example here where, again, just here in the U.S., there are 70 million monthly podcast listeners um, here in this country, and um, I haven't seen any global numbers, but I'm sure it's it's significantly larger uh, larger than that. So, um, and you can see within the podcasting realm um, the interest in that area and the the growth expectations there with companies like Spotify. Uh, acquiring podcasting platforms, podcasting networks to add to their um, their music platforms and their music libraries because of all of the potential growth uh, they see in that area. And of course, all of that content, again, needs to be consumed through a mobile device or is typically consumed through a mobile device and, and then through a curable. Uh, remote work is, is another area where um, there's uh, there's uh, tremendous growth patterns here. We've seen numbers that show that uh, that globally, uh, over half half of workers have worked remotely uh, at least once in the last month or so, um, and that um, uh, those numbers continue to grow. And of course, um, uh, people still need to interact with their coworkers while they're working remotely, and most of that's done through headsets or hearables of some kind with video conferencing and uh, chat capabilities and, and uh, even just uh, basic conference calling. And so as that continues to grow, we're also seeing uh, some early interest in um, not just remote workers, but also call center type applications where um, they're integrating um, sensor technology into the uh, call center headsets and remote work headsets that uh, a lot of people use in order to monitor um, not just vital signs, but things like stress levels and, uh, and other um, indications along those lines. So uh, we've talked a bit about the sensor technology, but the, the, there's been significant advancements in the sensor technology that you can add into uh, a hearable device. Uh, particularly around biometrics, the sensors are now uh, small enough to even fit into a hearing aid into the ear canal, as well as in um, in consumer hearable devices. And we'll talk more about that in um, in a few slides here. Um, there's also been tremendous advancements in hearing enhancement, not just in the, the hearing health and hearing aid side of things, but also in the, the consumer audio side of things as well with uh, capabilities like, um, like uh, audio pass-through to be able to hear, uh, hear contextual sounds outside of what's going on in the, in the, the hearable or the, the audio device itself, as well as um, uh, a hearing augmentation or sound augmentation or amplification 
uh, around the um, uh, the um, being able to identify specific sounds or frequencies um, that are coming into the hearable from outside or from the, the ambient noise around an individual to be able to either filter it out or let it through depending on what the individual is uh, uh, interested in hearing at that moment. And then last but certainly not least, the, in many ways the social stigma is gone behind wearing um, ear-based devices for long periods of time throughout the day. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, AirPods, for um, uh, helping uh, accelerate that trend of being able to, uh, uh, of helping break down that social stigma of, of wearing things in your, in your ears all day, every day. So that's certainly useful. Um, there's a, next we'll jump into a, a few of the, uh, there's, there's several problems that uh, hearables help address as it relates to uh, the overall adoption curve around wearables in general, but also um, that are helping drive the, the adoption of this sector as well. And one is this notion around the, the, what we call the death by discharge in wearables, where um, you may um, put a device on charge and forget it's there and walk out the door and it's um, and you never um, uh, never go back to it or forget to go back to it and the utility is significantly um, uh, significantly decreased if you um, don't see it as valuable enough to go back and get if you've forgotten it. So um, the enthusiasm is always very high uh, when uh, the purchase happens and the out of, out of the box and the first recharge happens and all of that's very exciting. You're um, uh, glad to play with the new toy and then the recharge period happens and uh, there's this plateau and uh, the, the second recharge cycle happens. But most of that is because uh, many of these wearable devices, particularly some of the, the basic fitness bands and other things are just not delivering enough um, unique and valuable insights to an individual um, that they find valuable enough to continue to wear and continue to, to recharge. And ultimately the device ends up in the sock drawer. And the, um, the time required to actually get to those meaningful insights, if the device can even deliver it, is, um, is uh, significantly diminished or if the, if the user ever gets there. But hearables are, are, are different in that um, the, the use cases around hearables are, um, are much more around immediate needs, whether that's hearing augmentation in the case of a hearing aid or listening to music while, while someone is exercising or conducting a, a, a teleconference when you're working remotely or if you're listening to entertainment or uh, watching a movie on a mobile device, all of those things uh, present immediate needs for hearable devices that um, if you happen to leave them behind, you're probably going to uh, go back and get them um, and uh, use them throughout the day, which improves that usage pattern and, and helps, um, helps with that continued usage to uh, drive, um, uh, drive those meaningful insights and those, those um, meaningful use cases. The second problem that, um, that hearables can address is uh, is more specifically around the, the comorbidities associated with hearing loss. And obviously this is um, more specific to hearing aids and hearing augmentation devices. But as the, as those, as the hearing health and uh, consumer audio markets continue to converge, you'll start to see this combined with the fact that uh, particularly in Western countries, the populations are uh, at a macro level, the populations are aging rapidly, you see a, um, a, an overlap here in the, the um, comorbidities associated with hearing loss and the ability of these hearable devices to actually address some of those comorbidities. So um, this is from a report from last year that um, showed some of, the, some of the significant comorbidities associated with hearing loss and even just um, uh, mild or mid-range hearing loss. This does not necessarily re refer just to severe hearing loss, but you see things like uh, three times the risk of uh, falling, 
three times the risk of cardiovascular disease, three times the risk of diabetes, um, the 30 to 40 percent accelerated rate of cognitive decline, and uh, higher risk for depressive symptoms. So there's there are um, significant comorbidities here that these hearable devices can help uh, alleviate uh, or um, help people avoid altogether, uh, depending on the, the use case and their, their scenario. And one of the other reasons that the, the uh, hearables are able to address some of these comorbidities or at least contribute to uh, the alleviation of uh, or avoidance of these these comorbidities is the the fact that the ear is a tremendous place to not only um, uh, interact with mobile devices and um, interact with other people but also to um, measure biometrics that have relevant um, uh, relevant indicators for some of these key comorbidities particularly cardiovascular disease diabetes fall risk Cognitive decline; those those types of uh, those types of of conditions. The ear um, is one of the best places on the body to measure biometrics, um, primarily because of the just the physiology of the ear and the blood flow characteristics at that location make it an excellent place to it, it, one of the best places on the body, uh, if not the best place, combined with the the um, the uh, um, the, the commonality of wearing ear-based devices today is, uh, makes it a great place to, to measure biometrics and to help uh, address some of these comorbidities. Uh, the forehead is also a good place, uh, and there are other locations on the head uh, that are uh, other good places. But in general, as you move further and further down the body and out towards the, the extremities, either arms or uh, or down the legs, you get, it's harder and harder, particularly from a biometric standpoint, to um, get accurate measurements that provide meaningful insights into uh, some of the health conditions that we talked about before. And this is a uh, big reason, quick plug here for uh, our partners at Sunyan. Um, I, for those of you who may not know, we, we partnered with Sunyan last year Sunyan is a, is a huge player in the um, hearing health as well as the high-end consumer audio space in making um, components for those devices that go in people's ears. And so we've partnered with them to uh, do a variety of different things, including uh, help address public health issues around these, these comorbidities and hearing loss and uh, other areas of, of um, enhancing people's experience through, uh, through hearable devices of all kinds. So some of, the, um, the, some of the additional emerging use cases that we're seeing in, um, in uh, biometric hearables in particular, I'll just talk about a few of them. Um, one is around the, the industrial, military, first responder sector, um, utilizing um, vital status monitors to um, get real-time insights into how an individual is responding to their environment, whether they're fighting a fire or flying a jet, or um, they are um, an industrial or a construction worker who's uh, working in the hot summer out outside and is maybe experiencing some, um, some deterioration in, in terms of their, their immediate health condition. In general, medical monitoring is a huge area of, of um, growth now in terms of the uh, hearable, uh, hearable form factor and, um, and not just from a hearing health standpoint, but you see announcements from uh, companies like Starkey and others who are adding additional sensor capability, including biometrics, but also other sensor capabilities to be able to um, turn those devices into personal health devices beyond just the, the hearing augmentation. And um, uh, speaking of hearing augmentation, this last example here is, um, it is some interesting uh, potential here for uh, hearables in general, but, but more specifically biometric hearables in, in terms of being able to um, address and, and um, focus hearing augmentation capabilities 
in the in the areas where the individual wearer is uh, is most interested. So if you're in a crowded coffee shop, as an example, and you're talking to a friend, you want to hear what the friend is saying and not all of the ambient noise going on around you. And so um, when uh, an individual is having trouble hearing, that represents itself not just uh, obviously in the audio coming into the individual's ear, but also in, in terms of the, the biometric response that the individual's body uh, emits as a, um, as a response to struggling to hear. And so there are, um, uh, there are ways to be able to focus that, um, that hearing um, direction and focus um, the, the capabilities of the augmentation to either an individual or you think about a different scenario where someone is walking down the street and that ambient noise becomes very important um, uh, to, to know what's going on uh, around that individual and to, um, uh, to make them aware of any potential danger around them or whatever it might be. Those, in that case, you, you want the ability to um, have that 360 degree augmented hearing so uh, an individual can understand how, um, how and what is uh, the, the um, sound context is going on around them. That is also um, an area where biometrics can uh, make a contribution in terms of um, things like, uh, is the individual moving around? How are they moving around? How is their body responding to that movement? Um, providing additional context for those hearing augmentation capabilities. So, um, all of that being said, I think it's fair to say that, that hearables will certainly be a, uh, one of the leading platforms for innovation in the wearable space as a whole, but particularly around hearing augmentation, entertainment consumption, uh, medical monitoring capabilities, and, and overall helping people live longer, healthier lives, uh, whether that's in a work context or in a, in a personal or uh, in a consumer sector is, um, I think, uh, uh, available and across the board. So with that, um, that's all the, the prepared materials we have. Um, I'll just remind everyone uh, that if you have questions or need uh, uh, any additional detail on anything I covered here, I'd be happy to dive into more detail on any of the topics we um, we covered here and um, and uh, answer any of your questions. So it looks like we've got some questions coming through now. Uh, have you ever deployed your sensor on a bone conduction headset? Um, so we have not uh, in a in a um, in a device that has come to market. We have looked at those uh, those form factors and. Um, we've done some initial prototyping uh, as to how that how a, a biometric sensor would fit into a bone conduction uh, headset, and uh, it, it's certainly possible. It it just depends on exactly how that how that device uh, fits uh, in or around the ear, and um, and what that uh, what that user experience is is intended to enable. So. Um, the short answer is no, but the, the, uh, the possibility is there. Uh, oh, and yet I guessed it. Uh, the next question is around, will you make the slides available? Yes, the, the slides will be made available. Um, we'll, you'll get an email, uh, should be within the next 24 hours or so, with a link to both the slides and the recording of the webinar. Uh, so uh, next question is around, I understand laws around hearing helpers are changing in a year or two. What are the details and how will that affect the market for hearables? Um, I, I'm pretty sure you're referring to the, uh, the fact that in next year, in 2020, the, in the U.S. at least, uh, hearing aids and, and hearing health devices will be, will, will be allowed to be purchased over the counter. Um, and without the, a prescription from an audiologist. And so um, that is, uh, that, so you can look up those, the, those details 
um, online, at least in, in terms of the, uh, the legislation that was passed a few years ago. And the rulemaking is currently underway now from uh, the, the regulatory bodies responsible for that. So in terms of how it will affect the market for hearables, um, overall, I, the, the expectation is that it will accelerate this convergence of um, medical devices and, and hearing aids and hearing health devices converging with consumer audio and uh, consumer hearables as the, and you're starting to see this now with um, some of the hearing aid companies. Starkey, um, I, I referenced earlier uh, at CES, announced a, um, a version of a hearing aid with a lot of features that would typically be considered um, wearable device features. So things like step counting and activity tracking and also biometric sensors to, to measure heart rate and, um, and then also integration with voice assistance. So those things are all um, all typical wearable consumer wearable device functionality that is now available in a hearing aid. And at the same time, you're also seeing consumer uh, hearable companies that are adding hearing augmentation capabilities. Companies like New Hera have been doing this for several years now in um, in the form factor of a consumer audio earbud, but providing um, uh, providing levels of hearing augmentation for those users. Um, as far as the the, the um, how it will play out in the marketplace at sort of the next level, deeper beyond that, I think is going to be heavily driven by the the laws and the or the rules and the framework of how the um, how the market participants can interact and what what are the requirements around. Um, non-prescribed or over-the-counter uh, hearing augmentation devices. So we'll see. My understanding is those those rules are set to be finalized in, in 2020. Um, next question, and thanks. It looks like we've got a, um, a lot of questions coming in now, so keep those coming. This is great. Um, what are next question is what are the biometric parameters that valence cell is expert in measuring any of the products on the market that use those today so yeah uh, so valence cells technology has been in um, integrated into more than 40 different products that are on the market now many of those are uh, hearable devices and those measure things like heart rate heart rate variability vo2 and vo2 max um, step counts and overall calorie burn and um, uh, things uh, things along those lines uh, within um, uh, the hearable device themselves uh, and, and then we've also got um, uh, companies uh, exploring with those using those inputs into um, more advanced use cases around things like uh, stress monitoring and sleep monitoring and one of the things we'll be rolling out later this year is the ability to measure blood pressure in these same uh, earbud sensors that we are putting into um, consumer hearables now. So you'll hear more about that later this year, but those are some of the, uh, the parameters that, um, that Valence Cell's expert in measuring. Um, next question is, will those components use major power consumption? Great question, and yeah, the, the there are always trade-offs between adding new capabilities and the power required to uh, to uh, make those capabilities work. And of course, in a hearable, you're dealing with uh, a very limited amount of uh, physical real estate, and the so the and therefore uh, the amount of battery that the battery size and battery life is very limited. So. The, um, the the nice thing about hearables, particularly from a biometric standpoint, is um, you can you can take measurements periodically throughout the day. The biometric sensor does not have to be continuously on, continuously measuring, uh, in order to generate meaningful insights from that device. Uh, and so um, you can also do. In, in similar ways, do things like um, um, duty cycling or, or power management in turning off 
certain capabilities when they are not needed. So with a hearable device, if you're just watching a movie on a tablet, then you don't necessarily need the biometric sensor or you don't necessarily need the motion sensor or uh, other sensors that may be embedded in the device. And, um, and so that uh, massively reduces the, the overall power consumption. And so um, designing the device and the user experience in a way where you, you duty cycle the, the necessary components of the, of the device based on the, what the person is doing at the time is uh, the, the best way to, to manage that limitation around um, uh, uh, battery life and battery size at the moment until we see any step function change in battery technology. It's, uh, we're, we're stuck with uh, the, the, relatively speaking, the, the battery life and the, the battery components we have today. Next question is, um, with the sensor becoming more affordable, do you feel that the, that is the biggest reason we will see more adoption uh, besides the, the tech trends you explained already? Um, so I, the overall, the, the sensor technology is, um, is a, a relatively small portion of the overall bill of materials in a hearable device. So um, obviously, the, the device makers want to get all of the components as cheap as possible um, or as inexpensively as possible in order to be able to um, uh, grow the adoption curve and uh, provide lower price points in the market, which expands the, the market potential for devices like these. But um, I think you're in, and you're continuing to see the, the price points decline and the capabilities increase. And so um, the, as that continues along with um, a variety of the other tech trends that I talked about earlier, will we'll certainly help uh, continue that, that um, adoption curve. Um, the next question is around uh, comorbidities of hearing loss. If hearing aids are not able to address these, why do you think hearables will? Um, I, sorry, I didn't mean to indicate that either hearing aids or hearables will or will not be able to address those. I, it, the, w the point I was trying to make was those comorbidities um, can be addressed either by a hearable or a hearing aid if it has the right capabilities uh, to um, uh, identify early signs of some of those comorbidities to provide people insights into um, uh, problems before they become too severe and they can go uh, see their health, health professional and get those issues addressed uh, before they become severe problems, whether that's in a hearing aid or in a, in a hearable device. I don't think it's one or the other. I think um, both long-term, both of those device form factors will, will be able to do those things. Next question, um, will data analytics be vital also to these trends? Yes, absolutely. Uh, great question. It's, um, and this, this goes for really any, um, any sensor technology in any domain, whether it's the Internet of Things, it's something measuring a jet engine, it's similar. The, the, the analytics of that data coming in is a critical piece of this to be able to identify those trends. And now that, um, we have um, advanced data science and machine learning uh, capabilities in combination with this advanced sensor technology. You, um, we see a long, uh, a long path of innovation and capabilities around the combination of those two things in identifying patterns and and signals within those that within that sensor data that we haven't been able to see before, just because the the um, the amount of information involved and the, the time and processing power required in order to glean those insights. So next question is around uh, why PPG in the conchable and not through the earlobe like traditional uh, uh, hospital pulse oximeters? Uh, another good question. So um, there's a few reasons. One is 
um, in a hearable device that, that people are typically wearing as they move around or um, uh, or it, uh, go about their, their daily life, something hanging from an earlobe and, and swinging back and forth is not very comfortable, but it also introduces severe motion artifacts into the, the sensor that can throw off the signal significantly. So within the, within the concha bowl, you can provide three-dimensional stability within the context of a, of a hearing aid or a uh, consumer audio device that you can't get through um, a, an earlobe pulse oximeter. And of course, if you've seen any of the um, valence cell webinars or any of the, the things we publish uh, around maintaining accuracy in PPG sensors, motion tolerance is critical in order to get accurate biometric signals off of these devices. And so um, the earlobe clips uh, present too many challenges from a, um, from a, a motion artifact standpoint. Um, next question is, can you share which companies are using valence cell technology for sleep monitoring? I, uh, unfortunately, I'm not at liberty to, uh, to talk about that publicly at this time. Um, hopefully we will be able to talk about that publicly in the near future, but um, at the moment we, uh, that's, um, that's not public information. Next question, um, how do we get started with your sensors for R&D to develop our products? So um, we have evaluation kits that we make available to anyone who wants to test out the technology. And you can um, email us at info at valencell.com. That's I-N-F-O at valencell.com. And uh, tell us a little bit about your project and what you'd like to do and how you'd like to test it out. And uh, we would be happy to help. Next question, these are great questions, by the way, keep them coming. Um, next question is what sort of advances in electronic substrates do you see enabling lighter mass and higher functionality devices, uh, more systems on the chip, higher density flex circuits, or uh, things like plated plastics carrying the sensors? Yeah, so um, the from a um, substrate standpoint, it's, uh, th there's, there's some really interesting stuff going on there. Uh, and it's most of which we have seen work in, um, in lab environments or on the bench. I think the, the bigger question with all of these, these advancements in making the, the, um, the, the substrates more amenable to a very small environment like a hearing aid or, or a hearable device is can you do it at scale and um, will it, how does it impact the other components in the system that, um, that the, the device needs to function? So um, I'll give you an example just with the biometric sensor. Um, uh, because of the way these biometric sensors work in terms of the optics, it, uh, the, by just the, the methodology of PPG is to shine light into the body and measure how much of that light is reflected back based on blood flow. They're, that light needs to be emitted by a device. Um, in this case, it's um, most commonly via an LED. And then uh, a photo detector detects uh, all of that light coming into it. And then we use signal processing to, to identify what, what of that signal is actually blood flow and what is not, what's uh, environmental light or motion noise or other, um, other corrupting factors that also come into that, that photo detector. As you, as you move those emitters and detectors closer and closer together, which um, by default, as you start shrinking these platforms smaller and smaller, the, um, the geometry of the emitter and the detector becomes more and more challenging. And, and that's just one example of, as you start to move these components closer and closer together, you start to get uh, confounding factors that um, it's in some cases were not anticipated and and that's where you see things work on the bench but not necessarily work in a in a production environment so um, at a at a high level those are those are some of the um, some of the things we're seeing and in, in terms of 
um, those advancements, but um, uh, it's um, it, we, we can have a whole webinar, I think, just around substrates, and if that's of interest, we can, <laughs> or substrates and other components that, that go into wearables and hearables. So um, hopefully that helped uh, answer the question at least a bit. Um, next question is, do you have, uh, do you have, or will you soon have in-ear PPG sensors combined with Sonian receivers? Um, and that uh, is a good question for uh, for Sunyan. I will let them answer that question. Um, I, I would suggest reaching out to them. I, I I don't know what they have and have not announced in terms of the the product roadmap around that. So I don't want to uh, overstep bounds here, but. Um, uh, you can uh, reach out to, to us here at Valence Hall and we can certainly put you in touch with the right people at Sonya to, to help get that question answered. Um, the next question, the size of the sensors are critical. What's the small, uh, what's the smallest to the largest in a wearable device in the ear? Uh, so I'm, uh, uh, I, I think the question is, what's the the smallest um, sensor for wearable devices in the ear? Uh, and please correct me if I'm mis misreading this question. Um, so um, the the smallest sensors we are uh, uh, putting in ears now are uh, in development around the the uh, hearing aids in the receiver and canal, and those are. We're, we're talking a few millimeters in um, uh, dimensionality there, and we'll have more details on those coming out in terms of the spec sheets and so forth coming out soon. Um, in terms of the uh, of the uh, consumer wearable devices, our what we call our BE 5.0 is our latest and smallest um, sensor for the ear. And I want to say that's four by three by a little less than two um, in terms of millimeters. I, but um, if you're interested, we can get you the specific specifications of that device. That that one is our smallest commercially available device for uh, for earbuds and, and hearables. Uh, let's see. Uh, next question is: Are these as accurate as ECG technology? Uh, the answer to that is yes, particularly this latest generation that I just mentioned, the, the BE 5.0. The performance we're seeing, even during high intensity activities, uh, uh, running and biking and, and, and other um, uh, at, at high intensity levels, we're seeing um, uh, on par accuracy with ECG technology in uh, our earbud reference designs with that technology embedded. So. Um, that's a uh, very exciting an advancement because it's not something that um, that any other wearable device has been able to achieve is that equivalency to ECG and um, and uh, that's um, that that is something that we have now been able to achieve so uh, I don't see any other questions come in those those were great questions I really appreciate the the interest and um, the questions I hope those were uh, I, I was able to uh, answer those questions uh, as much as possible and um, I still don't see any others come in so I'll, I'll just say uh, thanks again for for taking the time and remind you that we will be sending out the recording of the webinar as well as the slides if you have any colleagues or know anyone else that may uh, may not have been able to attend directly please do feel free to share those recordings and the slides with anyone that you might uh, you think might be interested and um, and we will um, call it a day from there unless there are one last check nope no other questions so with that, I will, uh, I'll just say um, thanks again and have a great day, everyone.